You are now listening to the Entertainment Rewards and Incentives Podcast. Here's our host, Jim Techman. Good morning, David. This is Jim. How are you today? Good. How about yourself? I'm doing well, thanks. <laughs> I'll tell you, I've been very impressed with uh, the growth, especially over the last 12 to 14 months, uh, watching you guys continue to charge forward and, you know, make some significant additions to your uh, to your portfolio and to your uh, capabilities. So it's been, Thank you. It's been Thank great you. to watch. Thank and you. Thank we you. Really, uh, we really appreciate you as a partner. Um, I appreciate you taking well, the time right now totally to uh, just talk through some of the things that, you know, we've done together. I was looking recently at the uh, it feels like longer, but uh, we've been working since 2013, at least on, you know, some financial uh, matters as far as business. Um, so it's about eight years. But like I said, I, I think we, we've had a relationship for longer than that. And uh, it's been uh, it's been great to watch you grow, and especially with some of the exciting additions that you've added to, um, to Augeo and what Augeo is doing. Well, I guess to start out with, it would be great to hear about your take, you know, briefly on where Augeo is today and the different brands that you have, and especially about your, you know, personal and professional background. I, I've, you know, I certainly can pull that stuff off the website, but it would be good to hear that from you and see where things are sure. right now and where you're going. No, I, 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 th- I thank you, Jim, for that question. I, I, I always love talking about Algeo. Not so much me, but definitely talking about <laughs> Algeo. So for me personally, I'm, a, I'm born and raised in Minnesota. I went to the University of Minnesota undergrad. I have a business degree, and I went to Stanford Law School. And while I was uh, in San Francisco for school, I met my then girlfriend, now wife, and um, we've been married 26 years, but actually just celebrated our 30th Valentine's Day, which is an odd way to think about it, but we had a wonderful Valentine's celebration even in the middle of COVID. Um, and, Congratulations. Um, That's great. And I grew up in the restaurant business, um, busing, cooking, waiting tables all through uh, high school, college, and uh, and then wasn't ever going to come back into the business, but ended up to do so in the late 90s as of the the restaurant industry sort of moved away from the family segment as you know family segment which was my family business embers restaurants was similar but much better to, to like a denny's perkins ihop um, the market moved away certainly over the dinner day part then the lunch day part um, moved to qsrs and then even the breakfast day part people would socialize over coffee or coffee shops or bagel places versus family style operation. So we began to experiment um, with different business ideas. We had this one idea as to how to help independent restaurants more effectively compete. And we spun that into a loyalty program with one of the uh, largest food distributors in the U.S. and and world for that matter. To this day, they're still a client. And that's how we started. And uh, and then um, we we won a, a, a client in the home improvement sector that really validated how we thought about um, loyalty, how we thought about engagement at that time, which was, you know, pre-2007, pre-iPhone, and so many other things happened in 2007 that changed the engagement tra- trajectory forever, most likely. Um, but but really, that's where we started. And over the years, we've, built, we've had a, a core focus on boy- growing, most importantly, organically, but then also through acquisition. And so today, we are a quote-unquote platform company, delivering loyalty and engagement solutions across the full enterprise, meaning employee, customer, member, and and channel or small business. And in, in overall, I mean, you know, our, our core sort of purpose is we inspire people to achieve more. One interaction, one transaction, one experience at a time. And, and what sits behind that is we have an engagement philosophy that we don't really white paper or talk about that much, but it really has three pillars. The first is we always think about sort of the individual benefit, and we look at the individual benefit, of course, economically, but also emotionally or experientially. The second part of that pillar is what we call group validation or group effect, meaning if we're trying to drive a behavior of an individual, how do we enable that individual to see others like him or her doing the same thing? And if we're able to achieve that within the solution itself, the uh, the objectives, uh, engagement objectives or whatever the outcomes are that we're trying to drive, 
or just, just accelerate um, through group effect or group validation. And the third is core values. Can we build when, when our clients have such such impressive and, and, and amazing core values? Are we able to actually embed those values in the solution itself? And when we're able to deliver on all three of those pillars, our solutions just work. And uh, we've been very privileged to work. Uh, today with, you know, many of the top companies in the world across their sectors. David, when you talk about core values, do you have any examples that you can point to as far as clients that you work with that you've been able to build part of the program uniquely for them on their core values? Right. So we're really sensitive to actually uh, naming clients. We, we're, we're careful mm -hmm. about that, um, and we, we probably can't do that publicly. But I mean, there are core. When, when, for example, we have a, a gigantic practice in human capital management or HR engagement in general, and when we're in, in those instances, many companies have, all companies actually have core values that are intrinsic to how they run their businesses. They're the foundation for everything that um, that they do, right? Um, and when we're able to take, for example, that set of values and build them into a recognition program or a connection program. So when someone recognizes, when there's a peer-to-peer -peer recognition, for example, within an organization, and that recognition will then be characterized as supporting one of the core values, that's an example of, of how we can do it. When we run programs on the c consumer side, or I know we've had some great relationship stuff with entertainment, where we've done some work in sustainability, uh, recycling, uh, and where we're able to elevate, for example, the, the, the importance of sustainability initiatives in a particular program, even on the consumer side, um, and build those values into the solution itself, it's just that much more access, it's successful. It's that much more inviting. It's that much more provocative, for lack of a better way to say it. Beautiful. That's good to hear. Uh, I know that uh, over these you know, past 12 months, a lot of companies have shifted their focus and done things differently. And um, the one thing that I've really been impressed with as far as the audio is concerned is during that time frame, you guys have not taken your foot off the pedal and you've continued to move forward both organically and then also with a couple of uh, unusual acquisitions. Probably the one on the employment side, employee side goes back longer than the last 12 months, but I know that recently you've acquired a number of companies that add to your capabilities. Can you talk to that a little bit? Sure. So, you know, we took the view early on in, as, as we got into COVID that during times of crises, and this is a crisis we hope that is uh, unlike any we will experience for the rest of our lifetimes, but during, experience, during times of crisis, the status quo gets remade. And those that are the most agile, the most creative, and the fastest have a chance to be part of the reorder. So our goal has been to, first and foremost, stabilize Algeo, elevate our employees and team and protect as many jobs as we can. And then, and, then, and then after that, set up our new foundation for whatever the next normal might be. So since April of last year, we've had four transactions, as, as you've referenced. You know, we, we, have, we had a, a fast-growing car linking business called FIG, and we're now in the process of doing something highly strategic with entertainment around that business, which we're super excited about. Um, but we spun that out. We acquired a company in San Diego, uh, brought in a venture partner, which has been awesome. And Auge, it's, a, it's still a subsidiary of Algeo, but that's been one of the initiatives. Another one is we, we acquired the loyalty business of Deluxe, and we just closed on that uh, in the last couple of months. We invested in uh, a partner of ours, that, a, a software partner of ours that we've been working with for a couple of years that has built some amazing connectivity tools for the enterprise that connects employees or, or stakeholders across the enterprise in ways that don't exist today, frankly, and it, they're very sort of oriented around m some of the more contemporary um, uh, connection um, means. And then the last one is we acquired very recently Wellington Experiences, which is a Kansas City-based meetings and events or experiential firm. And Wellington, I think, in, in particular on that one, that's a great example of how important it is to be adaptable in thinking during, during COVID. For example, last April, not just for us, but the meetings and events business, meaning live events, really took a turn for the worse. And 
uh, where you had, say, you had 100% revenue going into April, you know, many lost the majority of that revenue in that, in, for us, too, in that part of our business as COVID hit because all these events were canceled. So the question is, how, a, how rapidly are you able to adapt, spin up new sorts of solutions, um, virtual, of course, uh, being significant there? And so now, a year, almost a year later, we've taken the opposite view we took last April, which is there's a lot of pent-up demand. And as we move through um, COVID and come back to whatever that next normal might be, there's going to be a huge surge of demand for people wanting to re-energize to re- relationships, to be with each other. So w- we looked at it today very differently in the, in the exact same sector, meaning you know, experiences, meetings, events. We looked at that sector very differently today than we did, again, not even a year ago. And now the combination of what was our meetings and events business with Wellington's experience business creates a true powerhouse to lead us through this, what, what I would call this sort of pandemic transition, which will be a hybrid of live, virtual, and other kinds of very creative solutioning around experiences. Yeah, we've seen a lot of that, uh, as as you probably know. We've uh, been a big participant in a number of uh, regional and national conferences, and they've all had to adapt. Some are, some are still trying to find their way, uh, but others are starting to figure out what that secret sauce is. And it sounds like the combination of Augeo and Wellington is certainly uh, putting you on your way to doing that. I remember. No, I think, I think, I think the, uh, co- collectively, Jim, um, we've done since April, uh, we've done over 200 virtual events. Just to tell you how quickly we, we, we built a platform uh, that we didn't, that didn't, you know, exist before COVID. So that's exactly right. Yeah, that's great. Um, I was going to, I was starting to say, um, I was part of a, a conference call. I, I think it was a, uh, we were talking with a client and you were on and you were, uh, this was probably goes back almost a year. And you were talking about the fact that uh, we're not going to hide and hunker. We're going to get out there and make some things happen and put ourselves in the position where you're talking about now, where you're moving fast and trying to stabilize, protect and, and grow that business. Um, You mentioned that your first client was in the rewards and incentive um, loyalty space. Has you built the business, has your philosophy around rewards and incentives changed at all or evolved in the past uh, eight to ten years? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. In the, you know, in the past decade alone, you know, loyalty, you know, broadly defined, because people are like, what is loyalty? What is engagement? But loyalty has grown far more intense, and this is true across all segments and constituencies. Even in the employee space, as an example, think how critical – and elevated the importance of, of, of appreciation, recognition, connection is for employees today versus certainly pre-COVID. But um, there's a lot more intensity and focus on loyalty in general. Loyalty has been challenged by the proliferation of choice. You know, we, for example, we think that personalization, which you hear talked about often, is very different than personal choice. In addition to um, choice, the, the ease of entry and exit. And an increased desire for new and novel solutions is probably at an all-time high today. So our growth has been to, rather than sort of sell what we can sell, has been to embrace these challenges, stay in front of the rapid pace around race, I guess, around loyalty, and, 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 and evolve our product and our solution and our partnerships to grow or, or organically, acquire, as you've seen us do when possible, and partner with the very best leaders in their sectors. And that's, again, why we love our relationship with entertainment. Because um, what you have done, I, mean, I think we've been in t- together for probably a, a, not quite a decade, as you expressed earlier in our conversation, um, but entertainment has a, a solution in that second to none. And so as even now, as we're, as we're building off of both of our legacy systems, both organizations, entertainment and Algeo, and FIG, for that matter, are thinking about, okay, what's next? And there's some really exciting conversations that we obviously won't disclose here, but that entertainment and Algeo are working on that we hope to be in marketing on even in, uh, I guess, later this year. Yeah, one of the areas that uh, we could not be more excited about is in the card link space and uh, the opportunity to partner with uh, Augeo and FIG on building out some member benefits programs around that um, card linked. You've been you've been involved, and I think you actually serve on the board of 
um, the Card Linked Association. Um, what what do you see as the opportunities there and the growth uh, for your business and for others as as we go forward? Yes, yeah, so, you know, actually, it's interesting because card linking sits at the core of of like digital transactions, or it's a a, a core part of digital transactions. So the card links uh, the card links organization has changed its name to the digital alliance to digital alliance, and I'm on on that board, and um, and so it's okay. a, it's a very exciting time in card linking, and card linking it, it addresses at least two fundamental issues. One is for the merchant advertiser, and the other is for the consumer. So for the advertiser, meaning the merchants that deliver offer content, they're looking for increasingly the most efficient form of advertising, something that's 100% attributable to the actual transaction itself. And um, ad, in, in, in card linking, advertising fees are paid only when the transaction occurs, which is very different than other forms of advertising in terms of major media, many of the social platform uh, advertising solutions, Google and you know, Click and so on and so forth. For the consumer, they're seeking greater and more seamless value. So by delivering offers simply through the use of a registered credit or debit card or through a mobile wallet, this delivers on that. So what we're seeing, not only through our solution, and, and of course, um, while I'm admittedly biased, and this will sound slovenly self-serving, we have the best offer content <laughs> and the best technology in the card linking space, period, and that's FIG. Um, we also are able to deliver it in a very unique and seamless way through um, our um, uh, financial institution and publisher partners. And I will say that as you know, by the end of June, um, we'll, we'll be well at over 100 million active cardholders in our, in our solution, in our platform today. So I think that speaks volumes for, is what he's saying real? And the answer is, yeah, it's real, because look at how rapidly we're growing it. There's a lot of, there's, there's great growth in the sector in general, and then there's great growth, uh, of course, within the FIG business. And your merchant network is ever-expanding, and it's good to see just some of the additions that you brought on recently, and I know that that's a focus for your for your folks, especially the folks from FIG, to try and bring in more national, regional, and local merchants. That's exactly right. That's exactly right, and we think it's both. I mean, you have to. We have to be outstanding in terms of national merchants, and what we mean by national merchants are mega retailers, preferably tier one retailers um, across the major sectors, whether it's you know. Um, fuel, grocery, um, you know, QSR, you know, restaurant, um, uh, pharma, and so on and so forth. But then local is really critical, and in particular, coming out of COVID, uh, we want to we want to be there supporting and delivering traffic into local merchants. We actually stood up a solution that enables any small business to come to a site to sign up if they want to um, be the beneficiary of of these cardholders that we have in our system. So um, it's really critical uh, for the cardholder experience and also for the merchant advertisers, both at the national level and at the local level. So you're, you're going to put up, put up a self-provisioning tool where merchants can, can go in and enter in their own information, and I'm sure with some editorial, some, some people looking at it, then approve it and put it into the, the network. Is that what you're looking at? Yes, correct. No, it's actually live today. So it's live with a couple oh, yeah. of, our, of, our, of our clients today, and then um, we're going to be doing more and more with it as we move through this year and as, um, in particular, restaurant operators and others start to open up. Um, we want to, you know, make, you know, we have, it's live, it's built. Um, we haven't been promoting it as much because of um, what's happened to local, local businesses, but now as they start to come back, we want to be a, a, a core component of their success. So it's an investment we made. Uh, at the beginning of COVID, knowing that there wouldn't be a return on that investment until we somehow got through this crazy, tragic, difficult, yet filled with hopefulness time. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah, I, um, I, I know you're aware of it, but uh, entertainment's history goes back a long way, and much of it is along the lines of what you've been discussing with uh, the opportunity with the digital savings and the card link programs in that. Um, merchants, for the most part, have not had to pay a fee to be part of our network, but they do give us deeper discounts than they normally make available elsewhere. So as we look at what you're doing in this space, it really parallels a lot of things that we've tried to do over the years 
but it certainly brings it into the 21st century. So we're excited about what you're doing, and we can't wait to uh, start working on some specific clients with you. One of the things that's been interesting for me, David, um, especially since your recent employee uh, benefits acquisition, is the distinction between employee engagement and member engagement. As you know, in entertainment, we're primarily focused on member engagement, but I know that you have a large employee benefits and that builds uh, employee engagement. Could you give me a feel for how those two split out and what kind of attention you're able to put against both? And do you have a dedicated team on each or does the team work on, on both? Sure. Uh, well, let me um, begin with that last question, which um, is that um, the, we have we have there's clearly overlap in terms of our our solutioning and functionality across all of OGL, but generally they're they're very different teams. The expertise needed for what's happening in the human capital management space, all of the momentum around connectivity tools and the intersection of work life and home life and what that means both today and into the future um, is uh, very different than, I mean, there's some overlap, but it's certainly different than what's happening in, uh, in the membership space. The one thing I'll say is that, that when we think about sort of the currency of engagement, you think about loyalty currencies historically, and it's tied to points or something like that, we, we view the currency of engagement going forward as being around, quote, unquote, meaning, right? So there's a lot. So when we think about members or employees or even consumers, there, there is a fair amount of of similarity in terms of how we bring out the emotion of the experience, the meaning of the experience across any of these different constituencies. And we, when we look at, for example, the employee space, um, uh, there's so much happening. The business roundtable, for example, is made up of some of the foremost CEOs in the world, and they've really worked to, to redefine corporate purpose, not around shareholder return, but around elevating the importance of stakeholders across the whole organization. And within that is, is the is really an extraordinary importance placed on employees and the the value of employees like for example today in particular with COVID is placed at an all time high. So while companies like Algeo have always recognized, we have always recognized this at Algeo, but not all have. So it's a really extraordinary. And then the, even the SEC is recognizing this, and I think there's a, a now a quarterly uh, requirement that SEC reports on employee, that companies report on employee-related uh, engagement initiatives on, on a quarterly basis. So there's an elevated sort of or heightened focus on, on those that deliver performance and results and, and meaning to organizations. And this is different. And so, and so core to the corporate purpose in return is how we invest in human capital. And, and, and for members and membership, it's slightly different, although it's still elevated in terms of how we think about loyalty today. And we, and we align members more to consumers. So consumer loyalty is increasingly membership-like, right? Meaning think of the more premium forms of of loyalty today. Think of Amazon Prime, Target Circle, DSW Rewards, or look at what the, the launch, the recent launch of Walmart Plus and how many Americans literally they signed up within two weeks, or even the evolution mm -hmm. of the Starbucks loyalty program. I mean, there's so much um, uh, evolution of loyalty right now. We, we view that you know, membership and moving loyalty down the spectrum more towards membership where you feel like you're a part of something that's beyond just a transaction is really critical. And then the immediacy of whatever those benefits are in that program, in a membership program, is a priority. In other words, can we deliver them immediately? And uh, so these, the, the, the trending around immediacy and proximity and mobility all play into how we think about membership, which is different. The trends are relevant, but there's a different application between, for example, employees and, and members. What would your advice be, David, to companies regarding making sure they're realizing the full potential of stakeholder engagement? That's a, that's a, that's a broad and um, uh, loaded question. But I think um, I, I would say um, the, to, 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 to you know, let me answer it tactically because I think it's strategic. And that's this, measure everything. Metrics are key. You, to build mm -hmm. and sustain great solutions on the engagement front, it's, it's got to be quantifiable. And so invest in all things data that do this. So we think about HRIS systems and performance, you know, and operating systems within organizations and 
uh, all the different things we're doing to build profiles around employees on a self, not in any sort of creepy data way, but in a way that employees want to engage in, a, in what feels more like a social platform, but within the organization. So you, you take, again, the intersection of work life and home life and those things that employees care about both within the office or outside of the office, so to speak, meaning outside of working within work, what their interests might be, and you start to create connections and groups and impact in ways that drive more and more meaning to the employee experience. So our advice is, but you have to be able to measure that. And if you can't measure it, it might feel good, but it doesn't mean that much. And so in our view, metrics are key and, and, and invest in all things that help to drive how we look at this, how we are best support and deliver on sort of the, the, the human essence of the workplace in the future world at work. Are there any key metrics or measurements that you advise clients to take a hard look at? Well, I mean, the, the, you know, it's like anything else. We can only be as good as the data that's made available to us. So we, the, the more that operating systems can align with human resource systems internally, the more there is that we can do, right? And, and, then, and then you can potentially bring in third-party data sources or uh, through self-generated content, like I mentioned, in terms of profile systems and so forth. There's a lot that can be done relative to, to these things. Ultimately, what do, what do um, clients care most about? They care about the, the value of I mean, our clients, employers. What do they, care? they care about literally the value of the human spirit. They care about the human spirit itself. They care about things, of course, around retention and performance and the things that actually drive the growth of the business. But so there's both sort of the, the tangible sorts of measures and then the intangible things in terms of the human spirit, their culture, um, core values, and, and so on and so forth. Beautiful. Well, I want to be sensitive to time. I told you that we would try and limit this, and we are coming up on the top of the hour. So as a, as a wrap-up, I just wanted to see if there are any uh, any things on your horizon that we should expect to see in the near future that you feel comfortable discussing, and uh, what areas do you think are going to drive the most growth for Augeo in the next two to four years? Well, there there are plenty of things on our horizon. We we um, we definitely don't sit still, and and I think that's just core to who we are in our culture. But I think the thing that's really among the things that are driving us over the next two to four years is not so much the next acquisition, but where we see sort of the mega trending going. And consumers today and beyond today want to own and control their experience with brands, right, across all sectors. So 2021 and beyond will be defined by at least this mega trend, meaning the rise of the connected consumer whose needs and aspirations will drive product development and shape the overall vector of literally most industries. So think of Google Pay and Apple Pay and how banks are taking you know, on unifying the challenge of physical and digital experience, becoming the customer's digitally enabled advisor to financial well-being. So, for example, building on the payments idea, you know, payments sit at the intersection of where consumer interests and needs cross paths with, with everyday purchase opportunity. So the more banks can traffic light these intersections, the more relevant they become to the person's everyday needs. So who, whoever sits at the heart of the economic value experience will rise above the others. And our goal at Algeo is to stay immediately strategic in those discussions across the channels and sectors we serve. So what we do, again, is we look at, again, where we see consumer trending going, individual and human spirit and, you know, the essence of human capital management, where is that going? And we want to stay highly relevant in terms of the solutioning and the platform that we evolve with relative to uh, connecting those things to our clients. So that would be how I would think about the future for us. It's a little wonky at the end there, but that's all, that's all we think about it. And again, it's just, it's just understanding trending, staying all over it, and not just thinking of, of course, taking care of being operationally excellent relative to all that we deliver today, but then really be cognizant from a product development and roadmap standpoint of what do we anticipate is coming and to be the best advisor, the best consultant, uh, the best solutioning deliverer for our clients. Beautiful. Well, David, I, I know we've talked a lot about growth and the growth of your business, both organically and and uh, through acquisition, but as somebody who partners with your company on a regular basis, uh, 
we could not be more impressed by how you run your business, um, the quality of the folks that you have in it, and their focus on doing doing their job and doing uh, the best at what they can provide to their clients. So it's been it's been very informative today. I appreciate your time, and we look forward to growing our relationship, especially as we build on some of these new uh, offerings that you've been able to create. And we we look forward to partnering with you on those. Well, thank you, Jim. And we, as, as I said, we love our relationship with entertainment, and we love not only where it sits today and how we've grown it in the last number of years, um, but the um, strategic stuff that we're both pressing on together right now. I think this year and certainly into 2022 are going to be very transformative years for both of us in our relationship. So we're really appreciative of the relationship, and I um, am very grateful for this conversation. Yeah, thank you for your time. I don't take it lightly. I know it's very valuable, um, and we appreciate getting a piece of it today. Awesome. Well, thanks, David. Thanks. Thank you.